support vector machines. Why do we care about these? Uh, well, it's uh, fairly intuitive how they work. Uh, they tend to be pretty accurate and they're also quite fast. So uh, you might maybe wait a few hours uh, for some solution with support vector machines where you might wait days or months with uh, deep learning or uh, hidden Markov models as well. Um, what is it? Well, the basic idea is that we try to draw a good line between classes in high dimensions. Then we know what a new object is based on which side of this line it falls on. Uh, and there's three concepts that I'd like you to <clears throat> make sure that you know about. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Need a bit of coffee. Uh, the first one is the trying to maximize the margin. So that means basically you want to find a decision boundary hyperplane, which is uh, as far as possible away from the classes that you're trying to separate. So it's, it's the most likely to classify new data points correctly. Now, uh, in the real world, we always have noise. We have data that are maybe not labeled correctly and various reasons why we want to permit errors avoid overfitting. So uh, you can use a soft margin to do that. It permits some errors. Uh, and finally, the kernel trick. Uh, and the idea of this, if we're looking at the XOR function again, uh, we can't draw a line between these uh, in two dimensions. It, it's not possible, but we can easily imagine projecting these so that the triangles go up a little bit higher and the, the squares fall a bit lower and we can put a hyperplane between them and in two dimensions, it'll look not like a line, but in higher dimensions, it is a line, it's a hyperplane. Uh, okay, uh, so we go on to deep learning now. Um, why do we care about this? Well, we can get really good results in many areas, uh, state of the art, best results, for example, object and speech recognition. Uh, what is it? The basic idea is that people have found that if they add lots of layers to a neural network, it automatically captures a lot of auto important information, taking inspiration from humans who also use lots of neurons uh, to to, uh, to learn and uh, make inference. Uh, challenges. Uh, training can be very, very slow. You, you might need special hardware and GPUs. Architectures are also a little bit arbitrary. We don't really know what are the best architectures yet. Um, convolutional neural networks are a very common type of deep learning network. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, it would be difficult to use a simple type of deep neural network that was fully connected for data like images because uh, there would just be a, a massive amount of weights and we also have the vanishing gradient problem uh, where you've got so many weights that at, at the end, uh, when you're doing backpropagation, the gradient will fade out. Uh, so what uh, what is a CNN? It's basically a regularized multi-layer perceptron, like a simple type of uh, neural network, uh, which is using some techniques like convolutions. It's also using pooling, nonlinear activation functions, fully connected layers at the end, and concepts like padding and striding. Uh, in the middle of this slide, there's uh, an, uh, a picture of LENet, uh, from uh, 1989, uh, which where you can see you've got some type of image uh, and uh, Lacoon was starting with uh, handwritten images, I think, uh, handwritten digits. Uh, and so what you do is uh, here, there's, uh, there's first uh, some convolutions are calculated uh, and then there's subsampling and that's repeated. And then finally at the end, you have your fully connected layer with uh, some output saying, it's this number or it's this robot or whatever your problem is. Um, so we talked about convolutions in the math lecture. You know what that is. Uh, here at the bottom left, I've got an example of pooling operations, the subsampling operations. Um, so here at the top uh, right of that figure, that is a maximum pooling. So it's taking the maximum numbers from that 
that kernel area. Uh, and then at the bottom, that's an average uh, that it's taking. Um, one type of nonlinear activation function that's often used is the rectified linear unit uh, shown down below. So basically anything negative is just set to zero. Uh, and this is pretty good. If you randomly initialize weights, maybe this will affect half the, the weights of your network. Uh, and they found very good things about this function that it's uh, pretty good for gradient propagation and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and just to mention padding is maybe if you want to, if you think there's some valuable information maybe at the edges of your image, you can use padding to, to grab that. Stride determines uh, when you're pushing the kernel over your image, how, how much you push that kernel by each time. So for example, here in the pooling example, you see it's a three by three uh, kernel uh, that's being passed over this thing. If we use a two by two kernel and a stride of two, we also get it, a two by two output. Uh, right now it's stride one. Uh, recursive neural networks. Okay, sometimes we're not dealing with just an image, but we've got some type of sequence, maybe sequence of images or some other time series. Uh, and then we can use something like an RNN where there's feedback um, so we've got something at the bottom left here, we've got some type of input like x0, x1, xn. Uh, these can be words uh, or images or whatever. Uh, and then we've got some output y0, y1 to yn, uh, and it's passing through this, this network, this recursive network that's also feeding back into itself. Um, RNNs are not terribly good with some problems, like uh, looking back very far back into the, into the past. So one technique that was designed to help with that was long short-term memory, uh, which can deal with vanishing gradients and gaps and stuff by letting also gradients flow unchanged uh, using these gates that it has, input, output, forget. So it's... Uh, Basically, it's a little, it's more complicated version of this, also using RNN structure. Uh, recently, we've also had transformers come in to, uh, into play uh, in various fields. Um, and the reason was that LSTMs uh, were not so fast, they're not able to parallelize so well. Uh, and the looking back really far over time is not so easy. Um, so what was transformers? The idea, I think, was basically that we don't even need to use this RNN structure. We can just use attention uh, for a really good effect, and then we can massively parallelize our problem. So it's an encoder-decoder structure. Uh, and for people who want to know a little bit more, this is outside of the scope of the course, basically. Uh, but there's uh, some nice examples of uh, transformers that you can download and play with, like BERT and GPT-3. Um, what And I've, I've made sort of a simple diagram at the bottom left about what a transformer might look like. Uh, so you've got some input that comes in and then you do an initial embedding. Uh, so there's a word embedding uh, and also a positional embedding. So uh, sort of what is what is this, what number can we sign to a word, for example, uh, and where does where is the word within the sentence? Uh, and then uh, in we've got encoder and decoder units, so a, a bunch of encoders, a bunch of decoders, uh, and the encoders have a self attention module and a feed forward part. Uh, self attention, you're working with uh, some matrices, uh, the query matrix uh, for uh, for a word. Uh, the key matrices for all the words in your sentence and the value uh, matrix for this word. Um, so I, I've, I've shown sort of the basic calculation over there um, the for one head, and then you also have multiple heads, so you're doing this for different words in the sentence. Um, and you also have residual connections, so you can push forward the uh, the, the original values, uh, and you also have normalization. And um, so here, there's also a, a sentence here, an example, the robot and its wheels. So attention will help you to understand that it's is referring to the robot. 
Um, another thing that's quite useful is to do clustering. Why, why would you do this? Uh, well, uh, you don't need uh, prior knowledge about what classes you have. You don't need to label. And it's fairly easy to do it. Uh, what's the basic idea? You randomly choose some points in the space. We call them centroids. And we move them closer to the points that we've observed around them iteratively. Uh, challenges. Uh, one trick is always what do you choose for the value of k and how do you know at the end that you have good clusters and also what do the clusters actually mean. In an interaction with a robot um, you actually need to sometimes know what this cluster of behavior, maybe it's stuff that the human is doing, what does it actually mean so that the robot can give some type of meaningful response. Uh, centroid initialization, for those who want to know a little bit more, you can take uh, actually existing data points randomly, or you can actually generate some points in your space. So, uh, who wants to go a little bit deeper into SVMs? Okay, that sounds like a yes to me. Uh, then we'll go on. Um, so, uh, Maybe one important thing to say about SVMs is that the normal vanilla SVMs are uh, two class. So they work with two classes. There are multi-class formulations. Anyway, most people use two class SVMs and you arrange them typically with one versus one or one versus all configurations. So I've shown a little example at the bottom left here for one versus all for just the first class, this purple square. If we use one versus all, we have one decision boundary. If you use one versus one, then with three classes, you'll have one between the purple and blue square and one between the purple and yellow square. So one versus one will give you more decision boundaries and it usually gives you higher accuracy, but it takes more time. Uh, Live SVM is a very nice implementation of SVMs. Uh, sorry, also just to mention that if you want to do anomaly detection, you have one class SVMs, which you can use. Um, uh, live SVM, they recommend that if you don't know what type of SVM you're going to use, you can use an RBF kernel CSVM, uh, which can deal with nonlinear problems. So that's, I think, pretty good advice. And if you do that, then you have two parameters, C and gamma which describe the cost uh, and influence of, cost of errors and influence of the support vectors. Um, so uh, uh, these def determine also if you have overfitting or underfitting. And to find them, you can do a grid search. Uh, new SVMs are also quite common. Uh, C is often seen sort of as an arbitrary value, whereas new is a little bit more meaningful but they're both good. Um, so let's look at the math for anybody who's interested. Um, for vanilla SVMs, what we wanna do is again, we wanna maximize this margin. So the distance from uh, the support vectors of each class that we're trying to separate. And to maximize this margin, it means minimizing W, the absolute, the, uh, norm of, of W. And we, we can also formulate that as minimizing the square of W uh, such that uh, we are able to classify correctly based on which side of the line it falls on. Is it class A or class B? And we find we can do this uh, this way with this, this equation. Uh, and then we use the Lagrangian um, to simplify this. Um, so uh, doing that, uh, we, we've got these constraints. So we're able to add those constraints. Then we take the derivative uh, with respect to W and B, uh, and we get W is equal to this summation over here. Uh, and B, uh, we, we get this, uh, that this is equal to zero. Uh, so we can then formulate a new equation where we're trying to maximize L equal to this over here, the dual form. Um, so we notice here that we have uh, X times X. 
So this is a quadratic problem and you can use quadratic programming then to get an answer for alpha. Uh, so alpha is our Lagrangian term, if you remember. So you get all the alphas uh, and that gives you also W and B. Uh, and then to classify some new data point, then we can look at the sign of Wx pl plus B, which is the sign of this alpha Yx x plus B. Uh, and uh, we can, of course, use the kernel trick. So you can replace this inner product Xi, Xj with some kernel, uh, where I mentioned that RBF radial basis function is very common, uh, which is shown over here. Uh, and you can remember, uh, well, you might not know, you might know or you might not know, but uh, we can, we have these terms C and gamma. So gamma is defined as one over two uh, times the squared uh, standard deviation. Um, and then of course you, you can uh, make these equations more complicated uh, in various ways. Uh, it was just a simple example. Um, okay, cross-validation uh, going on. Now you want to evaluate, you want to train uh, and test. Uh, so why do we do this? Well, if we use a large training set, if we partition a lot of the data as training data, then we get better accuracy for our system. We get a stronger system. If we use a larger test set, though, we get a better idea if the system is good or not. Um, so why not do both? Uh, and the, the way you can do that is just to split the data into k folds. Uh, then we use the, each, each data point, each uh, datum to test once and to train k minus one times. The extreme example of that is leave one out cross validation, which uh, I used to do really a lot with SVMs because SVMs are fast. But uh, nowadays, I guess uh, it, it takes quite a lot of time to train. So you, people are not maybe using it always. Uh, some recent developments. Okay, um, well, there's really a lot going on in, in this field, but um, recently there's been some results related to esports with AIs which are playing really well and beating human opponents. Uh, we've also got um, a result about predicting protein shape uh, where AlphaFold won a competition and they did really well so that uh, in the article I read, somebody was saying that this problem is basically solved. So that, that sounds really great. Really exciting. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, that's uh, it for today. Uh, see you next time. Hey, Noah.